We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die, and the power they took from the people will return to the people. Don't give yourselves to brutes, men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! Good morning. Good morning. Or good afternoon, good evening. If you are watching somewhere else in the world on the live stream, my name is Andrea Austin and I work for the Human Rights Foundation. And I am excited, so excited to open the 2019 Oslo Freedom Forum. As you know, the theme of this year is Unite. And we ask and hope that you can connect with at least one other person during the next few days. Start a conversation, build a meaningful relationship that hopefully leads to lasting collaborations. In fact, let's start right now. Introduce yourself very quickly, just to the person next to you. Just say your name, and that's it. <laughs> oh, I love it! <laughs> okay, 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 before we get into too many conversations, this is a starting point for later. Please wave to these people when you see them over the next few days. Oh, it keeps going. There is a good chance that the person that you just met is a philanthropist, an activist, a creative, a business person, a technologist, or someone who just really loves human rights. But is this, it is this mix of people, this group, these conversations that you just started, that, and the conversations, the ideas that are generated out of them, this is what's going to affect real change. But before I get ahead of myself, we have to talk about some rules. And I know that there are activists and audience, or dissidents in this audience who are not exactly the best at following the rules, but please follow these. One, turn your phone on silent. And two, please, please, please be on time. We have many speakers who have who've worked for many months and traveled many hours to be here on this stage to share just in a few minutes a little bit of their story. And in order to give them the opportunity to do so, we have to keep the show ro rolling on time. So thank you in advance for being here. One other thing of note, on the next slide you'll see a little bit of information about our Wi-Fi and our social networks. So, Start this conversation, continue the conversations you're going to have in person, online. I'm talking to you people on the live stream as well. We want you to be part of this. Share, share a lot, share often. And on that note, if you are going to be using and taking advantage of the Wi-Fi here today and sharing and starting these conversations during the talks, we ask that you try to sit toward the back of the room just so that the screens and the light from your screens are a little less distracting. Okay, let's keep the show moving. I'm very honored to introduce our next speaker. She is a true champion of human rights. Please welcome to the stage the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ine Eriksen Sureide. Dear all participants, Human rights defenders, ladies and gentlemen, it's always good when this time of year comes and it's time for the Oslo Freedom Forum. Last year, 
we mark the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and we also marked that 20 years had passed since the adoption of the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. The celebration of these milestones provided many opportunities to reflect on the importance of human rights as a global standard and as a blueprint for, the, for what the world we would like to see. A rules-based world order founded on respect for the dignity and worth of all human beings. A world where we can claim our human rights freely and equally without discrimination. A world where we all have the right to stand up for others. And a world where we as states, through multilateral cooperation, through bilateral dialogue, we hold each other accountable to these obligations. I know that this world may be far from the reality most of you live in. And I, like you, share the deep concern about shrinking democratic space and widespread crackdown on fundamental rights and freedoms. But we are here because we believe and we have seen that change is possible. Through the tireless efforts and the dedication of human rights defenders, civil society, sometimes working with governments but often facing resistance, we have made some notable progress over the last decades. The reach and the effectiveness of the human rights movement has grown. The protection of human rights in national law has increased, and the opportunity for remedy for those subject to violations has improved. By working together across regions and with the support of civil society, we have continued to develop the normative framework for human rights defenders, strengthening the protection of women human rights defenders and those working for the realization of economic, social and cultural rights. We have condemned violence, acts of intimidation and reprisals and called for the release of persons detained or imprisoned for exercising their human rights and fundamental freedoms. For these 20 years, Norway has been responsible for the annual resolution on human rights defenders in the Human Rights Council. And the adoption in March of a consensus resolution, that's not a given today, I can tell you, but a consensus resolution on environmental human rights defenders is an important addition to our common normative arsenal. And the topic for this year's resolution, we chose environmental human rights defenders because we have to sound the alarm about the sustained and growing persecution of environmental human rights defenders. 2018 marked a disturbing record in the number of human rights defenders killed. Nearly one death for every day of the year. 329 killings, according to frontline defenders. 77% of them were environmental human rights defenders, working on land, indigenous peoples, and environmental rights. And these killings are only the tip of an iceberg of harassment, threats, and violence that environmental human rights defenders face across the world. To reverse the trend of increased violence and to empower and protect environmental human rights defenders, action is needed in a number of areas, not least the development of effective protection mechanism. The resolution also recognizes the importance of implementing the UN guideline, guiding principles on business and human rights. It underscores the responsibility of all businesses and enterprises to respect human rights, including the right to life, to liberty, to security of human rights defenders. But during the negotiations in the Human Rights Council, we saw that many of the reservations against strengthened actions for environmental human rights defenders 
stemmed from concerns about how these rights may affect economic development. These concerns are widespread and they have to be addressed. We therefore all have a very important job to do as governments, as civil society and businesses in bringing out a clear and convincing message that the fulfillment of human rights is not only an obligation, it is also important for achieving inclusive and sustainable development. I honestly hope that this resolution will be actively used by civil society and other actors to ensure that the agreement reached in Geneva is translated into meaningful improvements in the security for human rights defenders. Norway will continue to follow this work both in the UN and through projects and programs such as the International Climate and Forest Initiative. We'll also continue to call on all other countries, on the UN family, organizations outside the UN, to do more to protect human rights defenders. The Declaration on Human Rights Defenders is a call for action and a promise of protection. We, as governments, need people like you who are engaged and willing to stand up for the rights of others. I hope your participation here at the Oslo Freedom Forum will give inspiration, give energy and strength to continue your work. For us as a government, it surely does. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say on behalf of all the people here, you know, N Norway is so blessed to have a trillion dollars in the fund for future generations. And you have that because you have transparency and checks and balances and a liberal democracy that enjoys freedom of expression. And it's, it's, there are so many countries who should have something like this. What is also a blessing is that Norway chooses to support human rights defenders across the world with some of that wealth. So I want to thank you for that. And I also want to hope that you can make continuing and increasing investments <laughs> into, I mean, I speak on behalf of my colleagues, I cannot <laughs> give up this opportunity to ask for increasing investments into this. So, thank you. It's, um, it's, a, it's an opportunity I, I can't not take. <laughs> I, uh, I want to welcome you to, to this Oslo Freedom Forum, to the first day of the Oslo Freedom Forum. And um, I, uh, it's, a, it's always, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to do this. I, I also want to tell you, you know, the, the first 10 years of the Oslo Freedom Forum, in many ways, we're <clears throat> trying to figure out our place, figure out our place in Oslo, our place in Norway, figure out how to bring this community together, how to um, string it in such a way that the production could work and the communications and, and, and grow the community. And uh, we're now entering our second decade. We ended the first decade with a call for how so many of people in our community require healing and they need to address what they have been through. It's just not enough to give a speech about it. They need to address what, what they've been going through, what they need. Now, for this second decade, a key component of what we're going to be doing is engaging in celebration. It is, in fact, a reality that we are just so lucky to be here. We're so lucky to be alive and lucky to be born, and lucky to be born at this time, despite the challenges and sacrifices that so many people have to make. And so, with that, I want to say celebration is what a lot of this is going to be about from now on. Um, beyond the celebration, of course, what makes this event uh, rather different from other events is that you, you, it's rare to find a conference that um, actually addresses head-on the issue of tyranny. Most conferences, in fact, avoid that completely, especially given that there might be economic, financial constraints. Maybe there are people uh, in the audience that are donors or funders who have business relationships with all sorts of uh, nasty actors around the world. And so this is a, a different conference from that perspective as well. Uh, I will never tire of um, putting this number, this map behind me, 
because it really communicates in, in, in very s a very strong way. If you look at the colored parts, it communicates uh, that the world is, is not really where it needs to be in the issue of freedom. We're, we're, we're looking at, uh, in the colored section, uh, all sorts of authoritarian governments. Some of them are theocracies, some of them are secular dictatorships, some of them are military dictatorships, some of them are absolute monarchies. What they all have in common, regardless of whether they have a sham election or they talk about individual rights or even talk about climate change, what they all have in common is that they lack individual rights. And the worrying part, if you consider the vast size of this, is the actual numbers involved. That's 4.1 billion people, more than half of the world's population, 53% to be exact in 94 countries. If you consider uh, the big problems that, and, and again, I never tire of discussing these issues, um, the big problems that come from it, consider that 96% of the world's refugees come from authoritarian countries. What that should tell you is that people don't flee from countries that are free, 96%. 25 out of the 30 poorest countries in the world, the, if you want to call them the top poorest countries, are run by authoritarian regimes. 18 of the countries that have the, of the 20 countries that have the worst possible access to drinking water are authoritarian regimes. And the one that really uh, makes people's heads spin is the fact that all 28 military conflicts in the world, 25 authoritarian governments involved in them, and in three cases, it's authoritarian ideology that have taken hold of a certain sector of a country that is not authoritarian. So seemingly, the, the odds are, are, uh, are on us, to, the, or rather, the challenge is on us to resolve these things by addressing them as authoritarian as problems of authoritarianism. It isn't be against war, it's be against authoritarianism. It isn't let's find the solution to bring clean water, it's let's address the issue of authoritarianism. And then once they have a government that is accountable to the people, then uh, we will see a solution come a lot faster. So, the regimes that we address and, and I'd like to set up the first speaker of the Freedom Forum. The regimes that we address, some of them are so awesome in their might. And I would be remiss if I didn't refer to the largest tyranny in the world. A tyranny that really, while speaking one thing about their ideology and being run by the Communist Party, they are in fact a capitalist state with a slave-based economy. A slave-based economy that um, they use to engage in an economic war against Western democracies. They steal technology from Western democracies. They engage in all sorts of unfair practices, unfair trade practices, and they strong-arm democracies. They invade, in many ways, institutions of higher learning and the culture and use their money and their muscle to impose censorship on what people do. It, uh, at the same time as they're doing this, domestically, they're engaging in the construction of the largest surveillance state that has ever existed in history. If you want to consider the admonitions and the warnings given by George Orwell and by Aldous Huxley in Brave New World and Orwell's 1984, these are supposed to be warnings, yet the regime of China has apparently chosen them as an operating manual, as a handbook to do what they do. So the challenge on those of us who are working toward freedom is dealing with such awesome might, such awesome military and financial might, which is why this community is so important. And Oslo Freedom Forum is committed to being part of the solution. We are very much devoted to assisting and celebrating you, the people who care about this. Now, along with this, along with this celebration also comes an understanding that the sacrifices that so many people who are in the audience have made. Some of them have been shot at, jailed, tortured, imprisoned, exiled. They have been separated from their families. This is something that needs to be acknowledged. 
a very stark reminder of this is a speaker who was at the last Freedom Forum, Riyad Fares, who was assassinated in Syria. And it was on this very stage that he explained the situation in his country, what he was doing about it, the heroic people he was working with, and then he treated us to a musical performance. We owe it to him to come together. We owe it to him to collaborate with each other. We owe it to him and to so many people here to continue doing what we do and to celebrate, celebrate the fact that we're doing it and do it with a certain level of understanding that truth, justice, peace, all of these things are important but we are also entitled to a certain level of happiness while doing it. So we're gonna smile. I, I'd like to thank you so much for being here. I'd like to encourage you to fasten your seatbelt and to welcome the next speaker who will be addressing uh, the issue of Uyghurs in China and the horrible conditions of this Muslim population. Thank you very much. The Uyghur people are the other Tibetans that you have never heard of. The Uyghur's homeland uh, is East Turkestan, that is uh, referred to as Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region by the Chinese authorities. The Uyghurs have very little in common with the uh, majority Han Chinese people in China. In 21st century, the Chinese government has been very comfortable in stating in its public uh, remarks uh, the Uyghur's ethno-national uh, aspiration or ideology that make them to appreciate their uh, way of life, tradition, culture, is a cancerous tumor that has to be taken out or weeded out with chemicals. Submitting to the authorities' request to denounce your religious values, uh, your way of life, your language, your clothing, all have been seen as the way that the Chinese are uh, weeding out this cancerous tumor that eventually potentially pose political threat against the Chinese state. The political repression has taken a, a new turn uh, since Xi Jinping took power. Uh, they have launched a new fight, uh, quote-unquote, a uh, fight against three forces, uh, separatism, extremism, and terrorism. Do they have a right to protect its national sovereignty and uh, national security? Yes, but not in a way to lock up more than 10% of the population. The Chinese government have been using this as a justification for the construction and management and expansion of modern-day concentration camps. This is what we can see uh, through a satellite imagery. But when you talk to the survivors, the daily routine starts with the flag-raising ceremony, a minimal breakfast, and then uh, they start uh, watching videos, singing uh, patriotic songs, uh, chanting long life to Xi Jinping. Our lives uh, are indebted to the Communist Party. Islam is evil, religion is, is evil, and self-critic all day. They have publicly said they set up these camps to break the Uyghur's lineage, break their roots, break their connections, and break their origin. Imagine that you're on your way to drop your daughter off at school. Every hundred yards, you pass a checkpoint where because you're Uyghur, the police check your ID, iris scans, monitoring every moment you make. Imagine that once your daughter gets to the school, 
she's interrogated with questions such as, do your parents pray at home or read the Quran? And imagine her honest answers lend you in a concentration camp the next day. Imagine while you're in a concentration camp, your daughter is taken away and sent to a state-run orphanage. You only find out what's happened to her when you see her face in a government propaganda video bragging about the orphanage system. Does this sound like a science fiction dystopia? Absolutely. Sadly, this is the life of the Uyghurs today in China's controlled East Turkestan, which authorities call Xinjiang, meaning new territory or new dominion. I am standing before you as a human rights advocate, attorney, immigrant, and American. But more than any other title, my Uyghur identity is the most important aspect of my life today. Uyghurs like me are experiencing cultural genocide in Xi Jinping's China. Just two weeks ago, Xi Jinping told the world that remolding and replacing other civilization is both stupid and destructive ideas. Consider, this, consider the Holocaust. Throughout the history, crises of this magnitude have not started overnight or have not happened overnight. They started small, predicated on lies, and expanded rapidly. China has a long history of persecuting Uyghurs. In fact, I was born in a prison camp in Kashgar at the height of cultural revolution. For committing the crime of being a Uyghur, my mother was locked up, beaten, and tortured. She was forced to deliver me while wearing a cast from the chest down. This changed in the late 80s and early 90s. It was a time of relative freedom and economic progress. I remember going to religious services with my father on an important holidays. I witnessed the revival of Uyghur culture. As a child, I felt strongly the sense of relief and joy in being able to participate in community life. But the China of today is not the China of my childhood. China is rapidly regressing back to the worst version of itself. In 2009, China began militarizing social control in the name of, name of combating uh, extremism. The regime is implementing high-tech surveillance and on a vast scale, drastically expanding the imprisonment of Uyghurs and other ethnic uh, Turkic mi minorities, and exporting these surveillance technologies to other authoritarian regimes from Cambodia to Venezuela. Cities, towns, villages are blanketed with surveillance cameras. Entire population are subject to mandatory DNA and other bio biometric data collection. Monitoring apps are installed on every phone. Think of East German Stasi police state with cloud computing, artificial, artificial intelligence databases, and you will have a pretty good idea of the life of the Uyghurs today. If this surveillance picks up something that the government does not like, the arrests are made swiftly without any due process. In the last two years alone, authorities have detained more than two million Uyghurs indefinitely in the government, what they call, uh, euphemistically called educational transformation centers or boarding schools. Let's put that in perspective. That is the half of the size of the Norwegian population. And these two million plus people have names, families, aspirations, like all of us in this room. As we speak, China's detention of Uyghurs is the largest internment of an ethnic minority since World War II. Put this in context. At the height of Nazi Germany, they were imprisoning as many as 750,000 people. Scholars have compared these camps to Stalin's gulag that detained uh, over 18 million people during the period of 30 years. Ladies and gentlemen, never happened again, never again is happening again today in China. These camps put Uyghurs through conversion therapy, which I believe is a human engineering and reprogramming. Camp survivors said that they've been forced to study Xi Jinping ideology and to denounce their religion, amongst other forms of psychological tortures. Those don't 
follow the rules, comply or, or do what the authorities told them, suffer physical torture. It appears from the Chinese government's official statements and their actions that they have found a so final solution to what officials long called the Uyghur problem for now, without mass killing the Uyghurs. And what is happening in East Turkestan is not being confined there. These cruel methods of surveillance, AI powered racial targeting, are being exported to Eastern China and other countries. Today, 18 countries, including Ecuador, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, the UAE, and even Germany, have already adopted Chinese surveillance techniques to repress and or monitor their own citizens. In fact, China has been promoting these methods as a way to deal with the world's so-called Muslim problem. About 12 years ago, the Chinese authorities confiscated my parents' passport when my brother married another Uyghur uh, leader who spoke, a leader, daughter of a leader who spoke at this forum uh, earlier. I haven't seen my mother since my law school graduation 15 years ago. My parents have not met five of their eight grandchildren. Two of those five grandchildren are here in the audience with us. Up until last year, I was able to check in with my parents regularly on a Chinese messaging app. Despite the likelihood that we are being monitored by Chinese cyber police. Our ability to video chat and exchange photographs had given us a comfort and sense of connection despite, the, despite Chinese barring from, from, uh, from us meeting in person. But today, even that kind of basic freedom, the right to communicate with family members across borders has been taken away from us. And I'm not alone. The old Uyghurs with relatives in East Turkestan, even those who are not politically active, have been similarly cut off from their families. Like other Uyghurs, I worry that I, when, I won't even know when my parents die. This is not a problem for the Chinese citizens to solve, because they have no voice in the matter. Censorship in China makes it impossible for Chinese citizens to even know the existence of these camps. This is a problem for those of us in this room and leaders around to, around to solve. If you remain silent, this problem will persist and spread. And if you let this happen, what does that say about us? Many business leaders, scholars, government officials feigning, are feigning ignorance today. History won't be kind to those who turn a blind eye. Our silence is aiding the status quo. You no longer can say you did not know, because you know now. I don't want you to be just concerned or feel pity for me or my people. I want you to be outraged, and I want you to act. Consider partnering with an organization like the Human Rights Foundation. Make your voices heard and speak loudly and tell your country that they need to stop doing business with Xi Jinping's China. Pressure your politicians to trading, to stop, pressure your government officials to stop trading with China and companies like Huawei and Hikvision. Pressure the International Olympic Committee. Demand the Chinese shut down these camps if they still want to host the 2022 Winter Olympics. Don't invest in the companies building facial recognition, racial profiling, surveillance system. Pressure your government to adopt the Magnitsky Act. Business as usual cannot continue. The famous words of a clergyman by the name Martin Neumüller in the Nazi Germany have a new resonance today. When I was growing up, I never thought that this could happen. If you don't stand up and fight for your rights, this could happen to you.
Ser un activista de la no violencia es una labor peligrosa en muchas partes. Very dangerous uh, activity in many parts of the world, and Nicaragua is no exception. From April last year, the human rights defenders have been criminalized. Have we've been accused of as terrorists? We've been accused of uh, destabilizing the government. Uh, the Sandinista um, fanatics have uh, attacked us, and many of us uh, have a certain type of protection because we're known beyond the borders of Nicaragua, and you can imagine what would happen to someone who's not known outside Nicaragua. Organizations, uh, human rights defenders have been banned in Nicaragua, more than nine of them. We've seen journalists in prison. This is a very difficult task to carry out. But many people feel that uh, the 20th century was a century of conflict, uh, but this was a century also where we saw the development of many international par parameters uh, to defend human rights. In the 20th century, there were parameters to protect not uh, people the, to create non-violence. We had Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela. We had Violeta Chamorro say, in uh, Nicaragua, the first uh, female president elected in uh, the Americas who took us from war to peace. But how solid is the support from the international system towards non-violence movements? What has happened uh, with all of the international rules uh, to protect nonviolence that were developed in the 20th century? In the 20th century, do we still have a strong support for this type of movement? This is a question that is valid and really arises from the painful experience in Nicaragua, but it is something that applies to any nonviolent movement in the world, anywhere where you put your life on the line to not use armed arms, but this is something that will not work unless we have international support. Talking about nonviolence in Central America is incredibly complicated. Some of the most violent cities in the world are in Central America and Nicaragua, my country. Any person who is over 40 years of age has witnessed at least two wars, two armed conflicts. When I was 12 years old, I had to leave my country. I was a political refugee. I had to travel alone to a country without my mother and my father. I had to live in a refugee camp. And this was, an extra this was not an extraordinary story. This was a story of so many other Nicaraguans. But in the 1990s, Nicaragua changed. It was a different place. In a study that we conducted uh, through the um, uh, Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, we saw that uh, the value that um, the Nicaraguan youth uh, valued the most, uh, most was peace. They felt that peace was the most motivating factor in their lives. And so we see that also in the difference between 1979, when Nicaraguans took to the streets, took up arms, rose a red and black flag, and cried, free homeland or death, to last year, 2018, when Students, women, farmers, human rights defenders, they were not armed. And the flag that they rose was the blue and white flag, flag and they were not talking about free homeland or death. They were talking about free homeland and life. And why did they take this to the streets? It's incredible to see activists uh, from LGBT alongside faith-based movements, uh, students, farmers, middle-class people, working-class people, all taking to the streets uh, under the auto convocado movement, uh, this self-summoned, this self-movement, self-led movement uh, that was not rallied around a political party, but was just calling for free and fair elections uh, to remove uh, the dictatorship. Uh, but in 2007, Daniel Ortega was uh, elected president with less than 38 percent of the vote because he rigged the Constitution. And there were more than five billion uh, petrodollars uh, from Chavo, Chavez and Maduro, which helped him to establish a political system that can only be defined as a sultanate. His wife is vice president. 
Many of his uh, children are ministers. He controls uh, the judiciary, the legislative. He has total control of the police. The red and black flag is the flag of his party, which is um, obligatory to be um, flown in all schools, uh, poli uh, police stations. There was a total dismantlement of the opposition parties in the country. And so we had 11 years of accumulated indignation. And so this nonviolent autoconvocado movement came out onto the streets. Now, how did Ortega respond? How did Murillo respond? In the first days of uh, the protest last year, the regime assassinated at least one person every six hours. And they got um, snipers uh, to, in uh, strategic locations of the city, and they shot at um, peaceful protesters in the city. And uh, there was an, um, a very conservative report of the International Commission on Human Rights from the Organization of American States uh, estimated that at least 325 people had been killed. 2,000 people had been seriously injured, sexually abused, mutilated, tortured. More than 1,200 Nicaraguans, including journalists, including human rights defenders, had to go through the prisons of Nicaragua. And above and beyond that, 82,000 Nicaraguans since of May last year have been forced into exile. So these are unprecedented figures in Latin American history. This is a country of only 6 million inhabitants. And this pattern of uh, selective assassination through snipers is something that was uh, documented very well by journalist Wilfredo Miranda with his uh, report, Shoot to Kill. These are original post-mortem x-rays of uh, peaceful protesters who were shot in the head, in the thorax, and in the neck. This type of uh, extrajudicial killing continues today. We saw that recently with Eddie Montes, political prisoner, was shot in a Managua prison. He was killed with an AK-47. This is a military-grade weapon. He was a political prisoner in Nicaragua, shot this way. Today, it's impossible to um, have any type of protest in a police state in Nicaragua. Uh, you can't even raise the flag, uh, uh, unbelievable as it may seem. Uh, police will arrest people, will uh, confiscate their telephones. Uh, you have to show your Facebook posts, your tweets, uh, or anybody who uh, raises the blue and white flag will be stopped. Now, what has been the response of the international community to this type of persecution and harassment? Well, what we see is that the international system, if they don't pay attention to nonviolence movements, they actually make the situation more complex. In order for nonviolence to be successful, we need international solidarity. We need attention from the world. And that is exactly what Daniel Ortega was able to do for 11 years. He fell under the international radar. And for this reason, he was able to assassinate, expropriate, imprison, enrich himself because he fell under the international radar. Many of his um, cronies now, however, are part of uh, the uh, sanctions handed down through the Magnitsky Act. Uh, the European Parliament has adopted two resolutions, but we need much more help. <clears throat> People need to know what's happening in Nicaragua. This, these dictatorships have evolved, and certain concepts such as national sovereignty, non-intervention, these are concepts that are there to protect the rule of law are being used uh, by these uh, di dictatorships to evade international sanctions and to impede the nonviolence movement. One of the most difficult conversations uh, that a nonviolent activist can have is with a father or a mother 
who's seen their child shot down because they're a peaceful protester. This is the case of Miguel. His daughter, Stephanie, 10 years old, was shot in the head by an FSLN paramilitary. She's a warrior. She's fighting for her life, even though she's lost 20% of her brain and many of her vital functions are impeded. But my question is, can we look Stephanie in the eye and say, Stephanie, yes, nonviolence works. You need to believe in nonviolence. The world is watching. Stephanie, you are the generation of peace. Can we tell Stephanie that she can raise her flag without being imprisoned? To tell Stephanie that, we need for the world to pay attention. And remember that the concept of national sovereignty was designed to protect freedom and democracy, not to protect dictatorships. Thank you. My name is Masih Alinejad. I'm an Iranian journalist. Sorry that I couldn't make to be there. I'm stateless. I cannot get a passport. I'm in the list of travel ban. If I want to get Iranian passport, I have to go to the Iran's intersection and cover myself. But I am fighting against compulsory hijab. I myself, I call myself a campaigner for women's rights, but the government of Iran has different names for me. They call me a prostitute. A whore, they call me Ugly Duckling. They don't even know the end of the story of Ugly Duckling. And I want to tell you about why I launched a movement against compulsory hijab in Iran. If you are a woman in Iran and you don't wear hijab, you won't be able to go to school from the age of seven. You won't be able to get an education. Can you believe that? You won't be able to get a job. You won't be able to live in your own beloved country. We are not fighting against a small piece of cloth. We are fighting for our dignity. And I ask women to, you know, have a white symbol and go in the street in public to identify each other. You won't believe me. A lot of women were like holding a white headscarf in public, walking unveiled, which is a punishable crime, practicing their civil disobedience against compulsory hijab. I always say personal story matters. You know, I myself, I got attacked by a by an Iranian pro-regime guy in London. The guy was actually calling me, you ugly woman. He was mad because of my activities and he said that, you ugly woman, you're ruining the image of Iran. I was like, I'm not ruining the image of Iran. I'm ruining the image of the oppressors. And that scares the government. Being a free woman means that you're a criminal. Can you believe that? Especially me, I have too much hair, too much voice, and I am too much of a woman. My hair can scare the government because I have too much hair. Thank you so much for listening to me. I really wanted to be there, but don't forget, I'm not there, but go online and follow my hashtag. My camera is my weapon, all white friends. My name is Colin Crowell, and I'm the head of public policy uh, globally for Twitter uh, and Twitter's corporate philanthropy program. I've been coming to the Oslo Freedom Forum now for uh, several years, and I always come with a healthy dose of humility and with great respect uh, for the courageousness of so many people here in the room who are facing daunting uh, challenges in so many places around the world. Uh, but I come because it's invaluable to me and to Twitter uh, to be able to meet with so many of the activists directly and to, uh, consistent with the theme of the Conference of Unity, uh, to open lines of, in, of communication and to also uh, establish uh, ways to collaborate around shared goals. Twitter's purpose is to serve the public conversation. And we realize that many people around the world use Twitter like a public square. And we want that square to be safe, secure, and informationally nutritious. And notwithstanding some of the challenges that we're vigorously addressing with respect to the health of that public square, 
around abuse and harassment and state-sponsored attempts to manipulate the Twitter platform, there are abiding moments when historically smaller, historically marginalized voices can break through the local, national, and global media mix and have their perspectives heard. And movements can be born, just as we just saw with uh, White Wednesdays uh, in Iran. Another great example of this is the hashtag this flag. And here to share the story of that movement is Pastor Ivan Mawarire. Please give him a warm welcome. It's good to see you, Colin. In 2016, I accidentally started a citizens movement that spoke up against corruption, injustice, and poverty. And there was no way that an unknown person like myself could have started this movement that caused over 9 million people in Zimbabwe to completely shut down the country by way of protest. And the protest was smart. We just refused to leave our homes. Everybody just stayed at home, didn't go to work, didn't go to school, didn't open their businesses. But it was through platforms like Twitter that the voice of an unknown person could become heard everywhere across the world. And here are some of the benefits and what platforms like Twitter have allowed us to be able to do. Number one, they've allowed us to amplify the causes that we have. Robert Mugabe, the then president who was overthrown in 2017, and our movement played a big role in that, had owned the local press to the point that it was impossible for us to tell our own stories. But through Twitter, we were able to counter that so we could amplify our cause. Secondly, we were able to unite people around a cause, to bring people from across races, across the different spectrums, to discuss an issue, but to also agree on matters. Most importantly, we were able to stay safe because of being able to be more visible on platforms like Twitter. Just a few days ago, before I traveled to come here for the Oslo Freedom Forum, actually, Colin, some activists in Zimbabwe who had gone out of the country to participate in a peace-building um, workshop were arrested once they got back home in Zimbabwe, and they were accused of plotting to overthrow the government. Well, in order for me to give the government another reason to arrest me when I go back, why don't we take a picture together? I'll post it on Twitter, and let's, let's show them where we're at. It works for you. Yeah? <laughs> Can we get the house lights to come up? So we'll ask for the house lights to come up so that we can get all of you involved as co-conspirators. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, here we go. You ready for this con? Ready. Oh my gosh, you're looking good, buddy. Come on, let me see your hands go up, everybody, for unity. Brilliant stuff. Good job. Thank you very much. countries were rolling out their red carpets for the China dream. The umbrella movement in 2014 proved to be a defiant move from the people of Hong Kong. In a city where the majority of the population has always been so politically indifferent, why were these young students courageously standing up to this giant machine, one that so many were fearful of? 
Walking down the occupied streets of Harcourt Road, I remember seeing all these magnificent expressions of thought and creativity, something that I had never seen in my city. Graffiti, sculptures, art installations, small patches of farming, our own posted mosaic version of the Lennon Wall, and even a temporary study hall. And let's not forget the 28-meter banner of We want real universal suffrage that hung on for an unforgettable morning on the iconic Lion Rock Mountain. As a Hong Kong-born singer-songwriter, a daughter of an immigrant family who spent her teenage years in Montreal, and also the first female singer to have come out openly in Hong Kong. I had always felt out of place in this city. As a celebrity, I was told to stay neutral and not get involved in politics. Although I had earned fans along the way, received awards recognizing my efforts, there were still clearly something missing. And it was only until this moment, among the aspiring crowds of the Umbrella Movement, that I finally felt a real sense of belonging to this place where I have always called home. Hong Kong has always been a city focused on wealth and prosperity, seldom on politics or human rights, because in so many ways, we never had to. As a British colony, we became the financial hub of Asia, establishing pillars of free speech and human rights. We became the poster boy of East meets West. In 1984, a joint declaration was signed, announcing the return of Hong Kong back to China, at the same time introducing the one country, two systems model, which promised Hong Kong its freedom and autonomy for 50 years. Yet, this was never meant to be the case. Since the return, the Hong Kong government has been eroding our democratic systems in place for a century. Media freedom has declined rapidly, activists now prosecuted for peaceful assembly. Laws are now unjustifiably altered in favor of the Beijing government. For decades, we were promised universal suffrage. The communist government has done everything in its power to prevent this from happening. But where there is despair, there is resistance. When the Hong Kong as we knew it began disappearing before our eyes, a young and creative force swept across the city. Hundreds and thousands of us took to the streets, mothers, fathers, scholars and artists, an entire generation of youth poured onto streets, courageously and selflessly standing up to this injustice. To an, authoritar to an authoritarian government, dissent and protests are a major threat. On 28th September 2014, a day that I would never forget, the Hong Kong government fired 87 tear gas bombs onto peaceful protesters. Hong Kong people, smart and flexible as we are, grabbed umbrellas as tools of defense to block off the chemicals. With this one act, our movement became a worldwide phenomenon. The umbrella movement ignited creative activism in Hong Kong. For the first time in our dictated history, we have finally come to our own definition of who we are. We are neither Chinese nor British. We are Hong Kongers. <laughs> Unfortunately, after 79 days of occupation, the umbrella movement died off. 100 40 protesters were arrested, 
for this civil disobedience, myself included. Fear of political reprisal has become predominant among brands and businesses. People are intimidated by an intolerant government who suppresses opinions in remorseless and civil, uncivilized ways. Those who have spoken out are now prosecuted, such as young student leaders, Joshua Wong, Alex Chow, Nathan Law, Edward Leung, and the Umbrella Nine. Dozen of other lesser known names are now sentenced for up to eight years. In these gloomy days, young people are checking out. Families are once again leaving their home city in the frantic search of a better home. As a public figure, creator, and most of all, someone who emigrated and returned, the question I ask myself now is, what can I do as a celebrity? How do I convince this once brutally awakened, chosen generation that there is still hope in our own actions? After my involvement in the Umbrella Movement, I was banned from China. All my songs and social media accounts were taken down. All commercial work has ceased. Brands, sometimes even other celebrities, kept their distance in fear of being associated with me. Interestingly, it was because of this loss of the China market, because I could no longer rely on this easy revenue that I became grounded to reality. As I was forced out of my glamorous world, I gained a new perspective of what I could actually accomplish. I was brought into a new and vibrant world. In 2016, when sponsors avoided me for my political outspokenness, I instead launched a campaign to crowd-sponsor my concert gathering support from 300 local businesses with a total of 50,000 tickets sold out within hours. Later on, with my amazing team, I built my own system. I launched my own record label, signing young and budding artists, and also improvised local tours in different districts of Hong Kong, we sang on trams, in underground live houses, on sidewalks, and even in local shops. Just last year, we self-funded and organized a six-day music festival, which united and gathered 100 local businesses and music acts. By creating socially innovative art, music, and events, by breaking rules and reinventing the game, I want to pass on this message to the younger generations. Create your own possibilities, even when all odds are against you. Truth is, tyrants are afraid of the people. They have seen the power of peaceful, organized movements time and time again, and it threatens them. Fear grows in spaces where we feel alone, judged and cut off. The key is to not, not get discouraged and intimidated by the bigger picture, but rather to look within and around ourselves, to find people with similar values and identify the possibilities that exist in our own spaces by focusing on our everyday lives, on our skills and passion, we can and will reignite our courage. Whether you are a student, a scientist, a teacher, or a doctor, it doesn't matter. Do your best in what you do best. Live the life that you envision for generations to come. When the system does not provide for us, we take things in our own hands. Our fate is what we make of it. By reconnecting with ourselves, we will reconnect with others. And finally, 
we will reconnect with our flexibility in finding answers as a humanity collective. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you for having me, me here. And uh, I am really honored to be among you beautiful people. Uh, so today I have brought with me a song, which is in Cantonese. Uh, anyone understands Cantonese here? Yay. Oh, yay! <laughs> and um, I chose this song de deliberately because uh, it is a song that I wrote uh, about Norway. And uh, it is about a group of people who are waiting to see the first sunlight after the dark period of the polar nights. Sit 
Thank you.